What is that? Oh no, it can't be. Not here. No! No! I am not obsessed with reading with far aim, though it may seem like it at times during some videos on this channel, but I don't read the far aim as a bedtime story or have dreams about it. Oh, I hope I don't dream about it. to pick up non-aviation related books from time to time, and a book we can relate to well can be inspiring in one form or another, and their influence can be felt across multiple areas in our lives. And I believe that even subjects that don't seem to have any relevance to another subject, we may later find that things may not be so far apart as they seem to be. This will be a talk about paper with words on them and what we could make of it all and there is a seat saved just for you to join in on the conversation here. The Great Ideas! This is a philosophy book. It was my first proper introduction to this subject, and I never considered myself as the type of person to pick up and read a book on philosophy. I had just assumed that readers of philosophy have a very specific plan to do exactly that, like as if it were all a carefully premeditated act and only certain special people were meant to fully utilize these types of content, as if casually, spontaneously picking up books on philosophy, it doesn't happen, unless it were all by accident. I remember previewing bits of philosophy here and there, and they were so hard for me to follow. It felt like I needed an hour just to understand the first paragraph. So my first impression signaled that this was all far too advanced for me, and I lost all hope and interest in the subject altogether. But years later, I accidentally picked up this book at the library one day. By the way, it was lying out of place on a random shelf, which was part of the reason I was misled about it. But I thought, hmm, great ideas? Well, I could use some of those. I didn't even notice the part of the title outlined in orange. How to think about the great ideas. I had no idea what I just picked up. Yet I started skimming through a few pages, and I quickly started to enjoy the way it was worded. It felt like a pleasant, comfortable, flowing conversation with some intelligent, thoughtful person. It felt like an ideal kind of discussion or talk around a campfire. I felt so welcome with this book, so I found it really relaxing to read this one. I really appreciate books that are well written like this with any subject. There is a line in this book that goes, The object we are looking at must neither be too complex for us to grasp, nor too simple that we have no effort in getting to know it. Basically, this sounds like keeping it interesting. I would say one of the biggest impressions I took away from reading this, my very first philosophy book, was that it was an experience about really simplifying the complicated, even abstract ideas in life and reducing them to their very core essence. And at the same time, it was about taking what seems to be a really simple, straightforward thing in life and delving really deep into the subject to the point where you realize it's not that simple at all. Sometimes it left me thinking, wow, do I even know anything about anything anymore? For example, take the first chapter, what is truth? Pfft, well, what is truth? Truth is the truth, what else is there to know about that? But by the end of that chapter, I was impressed at how little thought I actually put into this subject, though we seek and deal with truth on a constant basis in our daily lives. I realized I was barely scratching the surface when it comes to thinking about what these basic ideas encompass. I had also assumed that philosophy was about taking a position and arguing and defending your perspectives. It could sometimes appear to others a bit arrogant or claiming to have an answer to everything. But I realized that this was not how it was intended to be seen, actually more of the opposite, that there will often be no right answers. 
In this book, it acknowledges that there will always be disagreement amongst philosophers. And I particularly appreciated this part. Disagreement is the very essence of philosophy. Imagine all philosophers agreeing. That would be the death of philosophy. A man does not understand an argument if he understands only one side of the argument. It is not the conflict among philosophers, but the unintelligibility of the conflict which makes the layman despair. I thought that was wonderfully written. Isn't that often the base for most issues we see around us? It's not always so much the arguments and disagreements themselves that prevent us from respectfully engaging relationships with others, but it's often that stubborn side to us that refuses to acknowledge and see beyond our own opinions and comfort zones. I think listening and understanding someone else's point of view doesn't always mean we support or agree with them. Yet it may be something people may be uncomfortable with and letting themselves go to even that point, ears and eyes closed defensively. We all have a habit of this, to some degree. It's part of being human. But it may not exempt us from our responsibility to keep growing. And growth can begin with listening. One of my questions on this topic was, what do philosophers do? I'm aware that I know so little about it, and I struggle to see how this could be a job, especially when it seems quite different from other, more typical forms of employment and ways to make a living. But there's a particular line within this book that helped me to at least begin to see it better. The toughest part of the job, which is to find the right method for doing this kind of work, which has never been done before. Additionally, it revolves around timeless questions and debates, such as the difficult and basic controversy concerning human freedom. That is when I realized the work of philosophy may often be relevant when considering how to proceed forward in the future, when our knowledge of the world and ourselves increases to levels never before achieved. So many basic questions in life may have no single right answer, but perhaps this is where a philosopher's work may help. It may be the simplest questions that come with the most complicated range of possible answers. And maybe, just maybe, not all questions are meant to have answers? For the next one, we have all consuming images, the politics of style and contemporary culture. A few of my favorite lines from this book is style, hard to define, but easy to recognize. How do you view style? Another one was style makes statements yet has no convictions. Photography signaled the beginning of a time when the image would become more important than the object itself and would in fact make the object disposable. <gasps> Ooh. It included a detailed study of how style developed often alongside with a progression in industrial production and increased availability of materials. Feudal aristocrats had placed sugar trinkets on their tables as symbols of their power. Now wealthy commoners decorated their dinner tables with subtleties made of sugar. It makes sense, sounds a bit obvious too, back then when sugar or exotic spices were not as distributed. But before reading this, I never really stopped to picture how sugar was once a more boastful display of your dominance. In the modern age, it's pretty amusing to me. The thought of it made me smile. Hey, stop flexing with your sugar packets. Gosh! There was a lot covered in this book. I would attempt to describe it as social, psychological interactions with the physical, material world. It was a rather in-depth study while still remaining interesting and insightful. A theme I found interesting was the idea of how reality is becoming diluted with the mass production and prevalence of images and surfaces that focus more on impressions rather than authenticity, all in this ever-increasing pace of life. Everything seems to come and go faster, so the boundaries of reality and fantasy start to blur. Wow, that could sound really lame, but it was interesting to see how this book explained it so well. I just get enthusiastic sometimes, 
and it doesn't always help. I was also intrigued at how what I was reading here felt like a lot of the societal shifts and critiques coming from decades ago could still almost directly relate to the societal shifts we observe today. Could that mean some of our fundamental concerns today actually have not changed that much since decades ago? Could they be the same problems with different causes? Maybe occurring at different rates? What are some example situations and concerns that come to your mind? I like this decorated page. Our engraved initial glass assortment. An absolutely new idea. The swellest thing in glassware. This mammoth assortment consists of 37 separate pieces. I like how a language sounds different in different time periods and places. So which superb pressed cut glass set would you choose? I like this one. This one's pretty neat too. Clearly, I enjoyed reading this book. Another good book with kind of an ugly, unsuitable cover design in my opinion. At first glance, I thought I just picked up some sort of romance novel. Like these images, they will consume you and there's nothing you can do about it. I was confused as to how this relates to the actual content on the inside. Or maybe this is actually a very fitting design for this book. Because after all, it did discuss about humanity's psychological relationship with objects and products. Maybe suggested here by the woman trying to kiss this confused statue? I don't know, he looks a little uncomfortable there. Yes, I still judge books by their covers while still reading their content and that will not change in me anytime soon. Creative schools! Don't we wish we had more of them? So do you like to watch TED Talks? I first heard of this author, Ken Robinson, when I came across his talk about whether schools kill creativity. Do schools kill creativity? How was your experience in your school? I find it interesting to study the matter and do what we can, where we can. The subject of education and teachers is not limited to the people employed in academic settings, but all of us are teachers to some capacity in the class experience called life. Our students in life are much more diverse, with all kinds of backgrounds. They may be younger than us, older than us, we may meet them anywhere and our time together may be anywhere between a single brief moment to a lifetime together. We can all learn something from another person, and that is where humanity can come together once again, long since we have last been in a school classroom. Among several of my selections, here are just a few quotes that I appreciated from this book. The assumption in school seems to be that you either have a good memory or a bad memory. And yet, the students who struggle to memorize historical dates or multiplication tables often have no trouble memorizing the lyrics to hundreds of songs. It's lack of engagement, not lack of capacity. This critical part of the learning experience, the learning that comes from failure, is far too often programmed out of the academic curriculum. This next quote is regarding to high-stakes standardized testing. How the subject is tested becomes a model for how to teach the subject. At the extreme, school becomes a test prep program. This would be a very narrow use for an education system that is expected to prepare the next generation of the economic society. The world economy no longer pays you for what you know. The world economy pays you for what you can do with what you know. And last but not least, not everything important is measurable, and not everything measurable is important. How has technology helped or hindered your learning experience? This book focused more on how technology could be used as part of the solution to many issues within the current education system. Proposals have been going around for a while now, calling for individualized, personal learning. One challenge is the fact that many classrooms consist of students, all with different levels of proficiency. 
So how would we best able to accommodate this difference in skill amongst one large group? It's a simple idea, but not as easy to implement successfully. One of the attempts to address the situation was to involve computer programs that progress based on the student's individual performance and interests. Rather than having all the students expected to start and complete a course on the same schedule. Some parts I highlighted in here is, it was this lack of collaboration and preparation that doomed the program from the start. I appreciated this comment because it emphasizes how even a project or idea that has a lot of potential can still fail if it doesn't receive sufficient support or preparation, just as important as the quality of the idea itself. Well, what's the use of studying education without understanding the organ we're trying to work with here? This book, I was really pleased I got my hands on it because I think this really added a lot of helpful insights about how the brain operates and how we can leverage that knowledge to be most effective with our teaching and learning methods. I found this book very practical for my interests and a lot of things I found in this book I wish was applied more in general, not only for people working towards becoming some form of teacher or instructor, even though that's great as well, but understanding how the brain operates and understands things is helpful in many other skills in life, such as effectively communicating ideas to someone and being more convincing, making a business sales pitch, or managing the engagement of an audience. Just for a quick preview of some of my favorite revelations in this book, the more we learn and retain, the more we can learn and retain. Simple yet critical in structuring an effective lesson. We can better retain new information when we associate it with information we already know, like building on top of what we already have to work with. This is definitely not unheard of before, but it's a practice that can still get neglected during lessons. No one on this planet has time to learn something, only to later forget it. There is so much more I would love to go on with this subject, but I am looking forward to continue on this with another video. By the way, I also think this textbook has selected an odd cover design. I just had to say it. But I'm sure we've all seen much worse. It still has good value to me, nonetheless. I also like reading biographies and career stories of people who somehow make it to great unforeseeable heights in their career. A career that didn't even seem to exist because it all humbly started as a unique, rare personal hobby or passion. An individual by the name of Ken Marshall. By his senior year of high school, Ken Marshall had brought together the two childhood passions that would form the bedrock of his later life, painting and the Titanic. Those early days, however, not even Ken imagined these interests would lead him anywhere. How could painting ever become a real job? And the Titanic? Well, that was just a hobby. A niche subject combined with painting that very niche subject. It can at times feel discouraging and attract discouragement even from other people who mean well. But Ken is an example how not denying his interests while taking on so-called real jobs, his passion came back around and he started attracting some attention. He wasn't yet aware that Cameron had been inspired in part by his paintings. The director even took a copy of Illustrated History into his meetings with studio executives to show them what the movie could look like. As soon as he learned that Ken wanted to be involved, Cameron asked him to join the production team. That was the renowned James Cameron with the 1997 blockbuster movie Titanic. I get inspired by stories like this where people kept on with their jobs even as they had to divert a bit from their passions while continuing to do their best work in anything they do. And then, somehow, some way, the dots connect and BAM, you're living your dream. I find these kinds of narratives to be encouraging especially when we have a part-time hobby or passion that gives us life. Sometimes. A dream come true is possible with an idea, 
they just need to be given a genuine chance. Of course, rules need to be established and kept up to date with modern times. A good example of this was with the Titanic disaster. The ship did comply with all the regulations at the time it was built, allowing it to be approved legally to sail without lifeboats to accommodate all souls on board. Of course, after that, many regulations have been created and updated to reflect the current maritime conditions to ensure better safety. However, with reading this book, it also brought up an interesting fact that rules also need to be cleared out of the legal system as they become irrelevant. They may even become burdensome to society and holding back overall progress. Too many rules can bring about undesirable results and consequences. Also, this book illustrated multiple past legal cases that were more on the extreme end to demonstrate how the legal systems can be manipulated to bring about more disappointing and destructive results, rather than allowing the legal system to be used to protect and benefit society. I tried to stay away from reading law subjects, much like I have done with the books on philosophy, but I found this book to be interesting and very relatable for the general reader. Maybe the far aim tries to convince me that nothing legal is fun. What a bully. Yup, that book, The Art of War. One of many well-known classics, as in, really old. Many of us have seen or heard of this one before. I certainly have been reminded of this one's existence, few times. One day, I decided that I had enough. I've had it. I finally picked up a copy and decided to see what this one was all about. It looked like it would be a rather quick and easy read, a listed collection of battle and competition strategies, and wisdom. I didn't realize that I bought a copy of the book that comes with additional translation, notes, and commentaries. But after finishing this book, these commentaries made it all more interesting to me personally. From within this book, I didn't expect to be met with, language is a living thing, and as change is essential to life, it is characteristic of our words. There was this particular commentary discussion about how the translation from its original language had long been debated over between translators and linguists, seemingly causing its own kind of war. Many people were seeking towards making the translation the purest, as accurate as possible. And it pointed out that as translations are being made from one language to another, there is always a little bit of meaning lost in the process. As in, each language, along with the basic, fundamental words, they all carry some form of unique characteristics or nuances. Such as some of the words that are used in one language that don't exist in other languages. You may have encountered a moment where, in translating between two languages, that we may have to do our best with explaining a word using multiple words in another language to make up the gap in direct meaning. So that was part of the struggle in endeavoring to translate the art of war to a level that satisfied most critical and passionate linguists and readers. And this work of translation is of course not limited to just this book, but many works of literature. Until I read this copy of The Art of War, I never realized how much I took our translated writings for granted. This is arduous work to do. And with written works in much international demand, such as The Art of War, I felt like this book has also changed how I view literature, their meanings, and cultural origins. There's much more to them than meets the eye, literally. Well, that's where I feel like this video should end, but definitely the subject of these books will continue to be featured in some way or another in future content. I hope you will join me in striving to read more, and more importantly, enjoy reading more. If you don't find yourself enjoying reading, it's not because you don't enjoy reading. Blame the book!
change books because you deserve a better book.